Please rise as we're able in mind, body, and spirit. Join us in our opening song. So there you go. Um, 
And that's what that ministry is about. And we're always looking for more folks uh, to participate by uh, helping to put those cards out in the morning. And that again the announcement.
pray that you will always lead us, guide us, direct us, and always watch over us. For we do all this, and we always come together in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen one we pray. Amen.
Have you ever tried to hinder God? Get in God's way? Church does sometimes, you know. Get in God's way. God wants to do things, and sometimes, church, we get in God's way. Peter had an experience of the early church attempting to get in God's way. This particular story is so important that it's actually repeated twice. It begins at the first verse of the 10th chapter, takes all of the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, and then starts up again at the first verse of the 11th chapter and runs through verse 18. So we hear the story twice. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that means you ought to be paying attention. You know? If something is repeated twice or maybe even three times, you ought to pay attention. Hey, Liz, how are you? <laughs> you ought to pay attention. And in this particular instance, there's a really, really, really important lesson that the scripture is trying to tell us. You remember who Peter is? Okay. Peter, the rock upon which God would build the church. One of the most important of the disciples. So it's a story about Peter, who was a good Jew. And he has this vision. As he is in Joppa, which is a town kind of north, near present-day Tel Aviv, if you can have a sense of where that is. That particular town still exists. Joppa is still there. Sometimes it's known as Joppa, as opposed to Joppa, but it still exists. So it's on the sea, on the Mediterranean. Caesarea is a little bit further north, but also on the Mediterranean. So these were two seaports connected by Lots of travel back and forth. So Peter is minding his own business when he has a dream. <laughs> that ever happened to you? You're minding your own business and all of a sudden, God wants to talk to you. And sometimes we don't hear God real clearly if we're awake. So God sends his dreams. It happens throughout the scripture. So in this particular dream, Peter sees a, a great sheet falling out of heaven, held up by its four corners. And inside this sheet are all the things that a good Jew should not eat. And being a good Jew, when a voice calls out, go ahead and eat what's here, Peter says, oh, no, 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 no. Lord, you know, nothing profane has ever crossed my teeth. No way. It happens three times. There you go again. God trying to get through. Some of us are a little more stubborn than others. Peter might have been one of those. Who knows? So when finally Peter gets it, he wakes up. And just then there are some visitors waiting for him downstairs. And they want him to come and accompany them to go to Caesarea to the house that doesn't appear in this particular version in the 11th chapter. In the 10th chapter, it's to the home of a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And so Peter gets up and goes. And now, after that whole process, when he gets up to Caesarea, he preaches the word, and Cornelius and his whole family are saved, and, and now, the church has found out about it. Uh-oh. The board of directors <laughs> has discovered something happened up in Caesarea. They're not so sure they're happy about it. The board of governors has figured it out, and they thought, oh, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. So Peter goes to Jerusalem, and he gets called before the group. And they say, what's going on here? Hmm. We hear there's some funny stuff going on up in Caesarea. But you've been talking to Gentiles. You've been sharing a meal with them. 
You've been talking about Jesus to those Gentiles. <laughs> We're not so sure about this, Peter. What are you up to? What are you up to? So Peter lays out the story. He said, well, I had this dream. Oh, boy, there he goes again. <laughs> you can just imagine. They're all rolling their eyes. And all yeah, we knew about Peter. But, mm, okay. He tells them the story. He tells them the story. And eventually, they're silent. But in their minds, they begin to understand that God's doing something. It goes beyond their expectation. Because Peter says, who can hinder God? Who will get in the way of what God is up to? And they are silent. And they realize that God is up to something. The commentator said that this is a witness not to teaching. Now Peter was one of those that listened to Jesus for the three years that he went about his ministry and he listened to Jesus teach. This particular witness is not to a teaching ministry, but to an experience. Well, I grew up Methodist, as most of you know. United Methodist was then trained as a United Methodist. And one of the things that they taught us in seminary was that if there was something that you needed to discern an answer to, there were four ways in our tradition to go about doing it. This was called the Wesley Quadrilateral. Yes, I am. I love the Wesley Quadrilateral. It's a long word. But what it means is that if you are approaching something and you're wondering how you should respond to it, you look at scripture, what does scripture tell you? You look at tradition, what does tradition tell you? You reason it out in your mind. And then you take a look at your experience or the experience of others. Peter went straight to experience. He went straight to experience. And the early church went, well, we can't deny your experience. Have you ever tried to deny your experience? Have you ever had an experience of something that was so powerful and then someone else would say, oh, well, no, you know, no. But, you go, but, it, but I experienced it. I saw it. I know what happened. You ever had that kind of experience? Someone tried to deny it, and you knew that there was no way it could be denied because you'd experienced it, whatever it was. When I first went to seminary, I, you know, I went all the way through college, three years of the Marine Corps, and got into seminary before I realized I was gay. I wasted a lot of years. <laughs> but I was in seminary knowing or believing that I felt called by God to ministry. I experienced that sense of calling. God speaking to me a couple of different times. It happened out of all of a sudden. And then I discovered I was gay. Mm. <laughs> and I was in a church that said, oh, excuse me, but your experience doesn't matter. And I said, but I thought you were Methodists. <laughs> because I experienced call before I ever knew I was gay. And I knew and I know that call trumps everything. Mm. So anyway, call <laughs> trumps everything. I had to look at everything. I had to look at scripture. And I discovered there are only a few little passages, you know. The vast majority of scripture doesn't say anything at all about sexuality or homosexuality. I had to look at reason. What did my mind tell me? I had to look at tradition, that was a little mixed. But when I looked at my experience, I knew God still loved me and God still called me. But that didn't matter. And so when I looked at the Wesley Quadrilateral, and I 
I can witness to that experience, not to the teaching of the church about human sexuality, but my own experience of what God was doing in me. And the church tried to deny that. They said, oh, will you please keep quiet? You just don't talk about it. You go ahead and ordain it. Just be quiet. Guess what? <laughs> yeah, I figured it out by it. I'm not too quiet. No. One, of the <laughs> One commentator on this passage said this, how sad it is, and I'll, I'll read it the way that it was written. How sad it is when man-made rules designed to protect our holiness and bring us close to God, prevent us from seeing and rejoicing when God grants salvation to those who had not known God's grace. Mm. Whoa. Man-made rules. Another commentator has said this, Peter was not initially aware of the vision's meaning. It's only when the three men came to him asking him to go to Caesarea to see Cornelius that Peter begins to understand the enormity of what has happened. He begins to understand that the gospel is for everyone, Jews and Gentiles alike. It is easy to say the church is for everyone, but the complexities of that statement are encountered and dealt with over time in arguments, conversations, and council meetings. It seems to be something inherently complicated about inclusion. But the gospel calls us to travel beyond our comforts and the fixed lines we have drawn in the sand. I don't know about you, but I know there have been times in my life when I've drawn some lines in the sand. <laughs> In my ministry, in MCC, I said, oh, no, 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 you can't come in. You don't have quite the right theological statement. Can you believe I used to say that? I look back at some of the things that I thought 20 years or so ago, and I go, oh, I feel like a different person today than I did then. I actually wrote a letter to Troy once. Troy Perry, our founder, because there was this, this business of trying to expand the boundaries of MCC, and I wasn't so sure about that. I wrote this long letter. I'm embarrassed now when I go that. <laughs> and he was probably going, what? <laughs> I learned a lot. I've grown a lot since. I think about things differently now, partially because of the witness of Peter and a lot because of the witness of others and what they've come to tell me about who God is for them. The expanding nature of God's love, not the diminishing nature of God's love, but the expanding nature of God's love. Let me tell you a story. This one's going to take a little while. <coughs> Hang in. <laughs> I grew up at, uh, some of you know, in a little church called Clinton Avenue United Methodist Church in Kingston, New York. And uh, my mom and my dad and me were there pretty much every time the doors of the church opened up. My favorite story is one time it snowed overnight. My dad got up really early Sunday morning and shoveled out the driveway just enough so that we could get the car out. We had one of those great big cars. It was probably a Buick or an Oldsmobile or something. We were able to get that car out of the driveway, we piled in, dressed in our Sunday finest, and we headed off to church. We got down there, and the pastor who lived across the street from the parsonage came out and he said, Howard, my dad's name, don't you listen to your own radio station? We're closed today. We were there, even though they closed church. There we were. That's how important that was for us. And it was a thriving church at the time. This was the 50s. Oops, I hated myself. <laughs> oh, well. It was the 50s, and the church was a thriving place. And I grew up in that church and learned to know the love of God there. Went to Sunday school. My mother ran vacation Bible school and sometimes also ran the Christmas pageant. 
My dad, in his younger days, I'm told, even taught Sunday school. I find that hard to believe. But evidently, they had a class of teenage boys. And they asked my dad to teach the class when he was a young man. And so he did. And he got there one Sunday morning, and boys being boys, they put a tack on his chin. <laughs> my dad was observant enough to notice it before he sat down. And he sort of pushed it aside. And the next Sunday, before the boys arrived, dad got there a little soon. <laughs> Carefully placed a tack on everyone. <laughs> they didn't look as close before they sat down. And they talked off. <laughs> then they promised to be quiet until the next one came in and they all got in on the joke. That's the kind of folks and the kind of church I grew up in. It was a church of love and grace. A church where the men would Sit, stand outside on the sidewalk on one side after church was over and talk to one another and women would stand over there on the other side of the sidewalk and chat with each other and being a small child I'd run back and forth between them and the women would be saying I wish those men would shut up so we could go home and get the roast out of the oven and I'd go over there and the men would say I wish those women would shut up so we can go home and have dinner and you know, I'd say would you talk to one another? <laughs> with my dad when we were visiting in Kingston one time and didn't really hear too much about the church from that point on, but uh, last year, or the year before, I guess it was some time, uh, a member of our congregation sent me a link to the churches in the New York Annual Conference that were in favor of allowing their United Methodist pastors and their clergy to participate in marriage because, you know, New York State was one of the first to allow marriage on the gospel. And so I looked through the link and to see, and, you know, maybe I'll recognize a name or two. I came across Clinton Avenue United Methodist Church. Aww. And the pastor and several lay people, too, from that church. And you, many of you might remember I wrote a letter. <coughs> wrote a letter to that church, and I told a little bit about my history and said thank you. Because when I went to your general conference in 1980 in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I sat in the, on the floor in the back of the room of the committee in the United Methodist General Conference that was discussing whether or not it was appropriate to ordain gay and lesbian out people. It was going through the petitions that various churches have sent in from all across the denomination because it was a pretty boring conversation they were having, so I was just going through the papers and... Don't you know, I ran across one that was from Clinton Avenue United Methodist Church in Kingston, New York, and it was from the pastor and from their council, I don't remember what they call their administrative board, I guess is what they call it these days. And they said, in no uncertain terms, do not ordain these people. Do not. Because you know the Bible says. I sat at the back of that room and tears streamed down my face. Because it was not the church that I remembered growing up. It just wasn't. The church that I grew up in would have never sent that kind of a petition to General Conference. And my heart was sad. Crying out in a second ago, tears coming. So when I saw Clinton Avenue United Methodist Church and their pastor's name and several lay people's names on that petition, I was glad. I was like, yes! So I wrote the letter. And early in the next year, Reverend Joe Schulte, some of you remember him, it was before church one Sunday morning about quarter to ten, and I was up in my office and he said, I, know I hate to follow you, Pastor, but there's someone here who would like to meet you. And this person turned the corner and she had an envelope in her hand and I recognized the envelope. How many of us actually send letters these days? It was a letter and I recognized it. She introduced herself and she was the pastor of Clinton Avenue United Methodist Church. And she said, she was about two hours south of here you know, on vacation and she said, I couldn't be this close <laughs> and not come to church. And so she came to church. 
and I took communion with her even when we got to that part of the service. Afterwards, we stood in the fellowship hour. I just didn't miss a meeting because I, I just couldn't not talk to her. So I spent some time talking to her. I said, so how are things at Clinton Avenue United Methodist Church? And she said, well, you know, the bishop was going to close the church. She said, you're kidding me. She said, no. It got down to about eight or ten people. Eight or ten. The bishop had decided not to send anybody. They were just going to close the church. So but somebody on their administrative board wrote the bishop and said, Bishop, we've got money. We've got some money. Not a lot, but some. You send us somebody. We'll pay that person's salary. But send us somebody, somebody that may be able to turn this situation around. So the bishop, you know how bishops are, God bless them, you know. They found somebody right out of seminary. Praise <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> he had that experience someplace at one of our MCCs. He had sent somebody brand new to some difficult place. Had <laughs> Either makes and breaks the church or makes and breaks the pastor, one or the other. God bless Brad, got saved. Or it got too bad. Praise God. But it's interesting because this young woman was in seminary and she had been a bartender in Greenwich Village as part of her life. You know, when you're a bartender in Greenwich Village, even if you're a straight person, you run into all kinds of people. And she had, and she felt a call in her heart, and so she went to seminary, and the bishop decided to send her to that church, to Clinton Avenue, the Methodist Church. She arrived, and she said, we weren't worshiping in the sanctuary because the paint was peeling off the tile. It was actually, it was, tin, it was a tin ceiling, remember those? Oh, tin ceiling. I used to stare at a lot when I was a kid, it was tin Stare at it. Beautiful stained glass windows, they were beginning to get up, so good repair. So they had the sanctuary closed off because it was really too big for a small group of people. So they were worshiping in the what had been the place where the Sunday school worshiped downstairs. That's where they were. Almost the first person she ran into, it was a street fair, someplace near the church, and so she was out and about. And she ran into a woman at the street fair whose last name, I can't remember it right now, but I remember the name because it was a name of one of the prominent families in that church when I was born. This was someone who'd been married and was widowed, had a number of children, but his wife had died, and then he decided finally to come out and had chosen the first name of Candace. <laughs> he was a trans person. He ran into the pastor of this United Methodist Church. They had a conversation, oh, I can't go back there. You know, my family's been prominent there. I can't go back there. Yes, you can, she said. The pastor said, you come on. And slowly, over time, she said, the pastor told me, she said, when I finally had to print 25 bulletins, I about had a religious experience. <laughs> <laughs> slowly. She opened the doors of that church. She opened the doors to people who wanted, once upon a time had felt as if they could not participate. Because you see what happened? I really and truly believe that when that previous pastor and his administrative board had sent that petition to the general conference, they had shut the doors of the church. They might not have thought they were doing that. They thought they were doing the work of God. But they had closed their hearts and their minds and their doors. And slowly over time, people stopped coming. 
because it no longer felt like a place of love and grace and acceptance. But it had become closed in upon itself. As if they had some rules designed to protect their holiness. Rules designed to bring them closer to God. And in doing that, they failed to see that they were actually drawing a line in the sand or on the sidewalk or at the front door, wherever the line was, and there were a whole lot of people who felt like they couldn't get by. They weren't welcome. And the church almost died. The church I grew up in. But once the door started to be open again, because then that pastor whose heart was open, it began to grow. It began to make a difference. One of the funny stories she told me was this. It was you know, years ago, evidently, the building was open to AA meetings. And at one of those AA meetings in one of the parlors of the church, evidently, somebody misstepped at some point, stumbled a little, and knocked the lamp over and broke it. And their administrative board decided that AA should not meet in their building anymore because they broke a lamp. Because <laughs> they broke a lamp. The only thing happening was at least, thank God, they were using their industrial kitchen to eat the homeless once a week. Thank you, Jesus. They did that. But that was it. None of the people who came to be fed ever came to church. None of the workers ever came to church either. Who can hinder God? See, God wants to reach out into the world and say, come on! You think you are unacceptable? No, 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 not to me. You think somebody else is unacceptable? No. Who do we want to somehow be on the outside? Who, who do we think can't be touched by God's love? Do you have somebody in mind? I hope your mind is blank. Because I don't know about you, but I know I've experienced God's love for me. And that's something that I want every single human being to experience. Because it is so powerful. And so profound. And so life-changing. But we want to sometimes make little boxes. And say, well, you have to look like this, or act like this, or dress like this, or be like this, or believe like this, or please don't believe like that. <coughs> and if you can stay in the box that we create, you can come on in. Well, I've learned God is not about boxes. Look at the world around us. How incredible it is. If you ever wake up in the morning and take, take a walk and look out and see the sunrise or at night go down to the beach and watch the sunset, how can you not believe in a God who loves all the beauty of God's creation? Wow. Who can hinder God? Who can hinder God? I want MCC. I want this MCC. I want all of MCC to be in the business of breaking open the boxes. Amen. Of letting everybody in. I don't even care these days if you're a Christian. It doesn't bother me. Maybe you'll become one. But come on in. Oh, well, you know, they can't take communion. There's a, uh, we, we did a, I think this one's on communion. We got something this week. Our theology team is doing a survey on one thing or another, and I think this one was about communion, the last one was about baptism. And so, you know, do you, do you think there's, you know, a person can only take communion if? Or, you know, what were you taught about communion? What do you believe about communion? That it's transubstantiation, consubstantiation, no presence, or it's fire? Most of you now have no clue what I just said. <laughs> 
Should you keep people away because they don't believe just the way you do? No. Because they don't even care if you're a Christian. I gave communion one time to a, a person who was visiting us, and she was here again. She'd been here a couple of years ago. I actually have the postcard that, that she sent. She's Japanese. You know, she had never attended a Christian church until she came here to King of Peace. Can you imagine? Had never attended a Christian church. Not in Japan, not anywhere. Until she came here. Now, can you imagine MCC being the first Christian experience anybody ever had? <laughs> something that is keeping God from working inside you. Somebody told you something 30, 40, 50 years ago that still hurts. Let it go. Let it go. Because there is nothing that can hinder God from what God's about. You may try to set up a roadblock, but God's going to break that roadblock down. And someone might have tried to build a roadblock for you, but God's Spirit will find, help you find a way around it, or under it, or over it, to get beyond it. so that we do not hinder you from the work you are about. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, a couple things. As the ushers move to wait upon us, I think we have a slide. It's hard to see here, but oh wait, yeah, right up there in that right-hand corner, if 
Did you see that number? It's been laid before us by a member of this congregation who wants to see us get to 325,000. And the challenge is this. For every dollar additionally pledged, so if you haven't made a pledge yet, I encourage you to do so. If you've made a pledge, think about expanding it just a little bit. For every additional dollar pledged through $20,000, this individual will give a quarter on the dollar, so he will give an additional 5000 If we can get to 320000 he will make sure we reach our $325,000 goal. Now, I want to thank that person. He's not here, actually. But I want to thank that person for putting that up in the front row. And I want you to pray about getting us to that $325,000 for this year. Okay? The other good thing, and this is the pledge card you use, I was pulling out, so you look at it. And I want you to know somebody handed me an envelope this morning, and it's thick. So whoever's counting the offering today, you got some bills to count. There's $1,000 worth of them, actually. And it goes, Steve, to the Human Outreach Team. So thank you for that. You are a generous people. You are. You're a generous people. Never forget that. Well, the ushers wait upon us. God, we are generous because you are generous. You pour forth upon us such blessings, and sometimes it's so hard that when we stop to try to count them, we can't, because they are infinite in number. So, out of the blessings that you have poured forth upon us, we return our tithes and our offerings to you. Receive all that we give, and in every way, teach us. To make it useful that your good news, that your word, that your love might spread forth from these doors into the world. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <coughs>
as in all metropolitan community churches, everyone, everyone is welcome at this table. You do not need to be a member of this or any other church in order to receive these gifts from God. We invite you to come forward to receive communion and a brief prayer of blessing. If you'd like to receive communion only, there will be servers wearing white stoles. <coughs> and if you'd like a longer prayer of petition or thanksgiving, prayer partners will be available on either end of the sanctuary. If you would like communion to be brought to you, please inform one of the ushers. And before and after receiving communion, please maintain an atmosphere of quiet respect for those around you. God be with you. And also with you. Open your hearts. We open them to God. Let us give thanks to our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, God of our Lord Jesus Christ. By your great mercy, we have been anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. Declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Therefore, with your people and all angels and the whole company of heaven, we join in the sing in this song of unending praise, singing. same meal he took the cup and again he gave God thanks and blessed it. And he offered it to each one present. And he said, drink from this each of you. This cup is the blood of a new cup. It is poured out for you and for the whole world for the forgiveness of sin. No one is excluded. It is for everyone. When you drink from this cup and when you share this bread, I will be present with you. You come. The table has been prepared and God is present in this place.
MCC. Coming together to celebrate God's love. We are the people of King of Peace Metropolitan Community Church. Going out to share God's love for all. And we go in hope, in peace. God bless you first. It's okay.